Hello, I'm Cindy Brannon, and welcome to the Keeping Your Keys podcast. In this episode, I am going to be exploring the great mother goddess as archetype, how the mother shows up in our own lives, and I'll be focusing on the goddess Hecate, who I wrote about in my book, Keeping Your Keys, an introduction to Hecate's modern witchcraft, and also in my book, Entering Hecate's Garden, the magic, medicine, and mystery of plant spirit witchcraft. In my teaching and writing, I often refer to Hecate as one face of the great mother goddess. These days, we can get kind of tribalized a little bit in about how we see the goddesses because we have access to so information. And when we first awaken to the goddess within, we can become really, really concerned about getting her name right, that we're identifying the precise goddess that we're encountering in our dreams. You know, she's sending us signs, synchronicities, she's taking up space in our imagination and so on. Because we have access to all this information, it does kind of lead to what, what I said, this, you know, wanting to get the goddess right and not make mistaking her for someone else. And while this is so important as we sort out our own inner world and what our soul sings in terms of the goddess, we also need to keep in mind that to the ancients, you know, they didn't have access to thousands of different goddesses around the world. The goddess that they venerated, particularly when it comes to the more ancient um, cults dating back, you know, as far as we know in in history, even dating back to 30,000 years ago with uh, Venus of Willendorf, they were local goddesses um, with the rise of civilization and trade and so on in the ancient Mediterranean. These goddesses that were great mothers, both light and dark, day and night, creation and destruction, uh, traveled with the traders and those emigrating to different places So that we have a lot of recorded history that still exists that shows different faces of the great mother goddess during this time, you know, say 3000 years ago to the rise of Christianity. There's a lot of remaining history. And because we have access to all that information today, what can happen is that we feel that there is one right goddess that, you know, maybe Hecate is the goddess and other goddesses, you know, aren't the same and that, well, Hecate is associated with witchcraft. How can she also be associated with uh, being the great mother? Or we can take a goddess like Cabelli, for example, who was Magna Mater uh, to the Romans and say that she was only a great mother. And because she was Magna Mater, there is no other Magna Mater. These ancient civilizations, villages, towns, islands, nations, and so on, were very different in the information that they had access to in that they didn't know there was so many goddesses perhaps as we, it was so much information today with the internet. A lot of it is not very good. Um, In terms of Hecate's history, certainly from the earliest records that we have of Hecate, Uh, We could begin by talking about Hesiod's Theogony that was written 3,000 years ago about uh, where he calls her um, the one who rules over land, sea, and sky, and so on, which certainly indicates that she is an all-mother figure. So there's a lot of information from different areas in the ancient Mediterranean that suggests that Hecate was one face of Magna Mater, the great mother goddess. Of course, we have statues and so on that associate her with Cabelli, but we need to keep in mind that that's about one specific region. And in these regions, um, just as we as individuals today or even the groups we belong to can have different understandings of the goddess, it was the same back then. So there is no one pure face of Magna Mater. Um, And Hecate, certainly for the ancients, in different areas occupied the role of great mother goddess. 
And I want to really dive into this because, like I said, in the book, the Keeping Your Keys book, I talk a little bit about Hecate as the great mother goddess, but I didn't get into it in great detail. So I wanted to dedicate an entire episode of the podcast exploring the great mother goddess with an emphasis on Hecate and you know what that means to us here in the 21st century and how we might experience Hecate um, as the healing mother, the wise mother who comes to us. So in the book, if you're following along the lessons in the book, this corresponds really well to lesson four, Hecate and her many names. Ancient Hecate's many roles. From the ancient sources, we know that Hecate was a liminal goddess standing between worlds, particularly at the threshold of life and death. I go on in this passage to say she was described in many diverse ways, including mother of all, queen, savior, and world soul. At different places in this book, I refer only briefly to Hecate's uh, role in what's known as the Chaldean Oracles, which is a collection of philosophical fragments describing the origins and function of the universe in what scholars might call Neoplatonic terms. In the Chaldean Oracles, she is portrayed as an all-mother figure. She is seen as the world soul or anima mundi from which particularly the material world uh, flows from her womb. Although it may be translated somewhat differently, perhaps as flank, uh, but you and I both know that uh, the womb is not in the flank. That's not where babies come from. They don't come from our thighs. Anyway, uh, back to the, the, the point about the Chaldean Oracle. So in the Chaldean Oracles, she is portrayed as this anima mundi. And even in the Oracles and in other texts, Hecate and uh, Rhea, who was, who was another face of the great mother goddess, in the ancient, in some parts of the ancient Mediterranean, are often used interchangeably. So here we have evidence that the authors of these ancient texts um, were understanding that the great mother goddess had different faces. She could be Rhea, she could be Hecate, she could be Kybele, um, and then that these were visages that she presented to us. And certainly uh, Hecate, who is so closely aligned with Artemis, often they were interchangeable uh, and closely entwined in ancient text. And certainly we know um, that there is a version of Artemis that was worshiped in parts of modern day Turkey that embodied the all mother goddess. And you may have seen those statues of Artemis at Ephesus um, where she is the embodiment of the all mother. So there is so many different faces to the mother goddess. And even in the ancient Mediterranean, these were, these were different. All this is to say that there is no one right face of the mother goddess and that Hecate certainly to the ancients was a mother goddess figure to many of them. One of the ancient texts that has really just captivated me over the years and that I've studied is what's known as the Greek magical papyri. This is a collection of rituals and spells. They are fragments. And what remains are these beautiful petitions, spell formulas, and so on that were found in Egypt and they are a mixture of Greek, uh, Latin, Egyptian, and Hebrew. They mix the languages, they mix the, the practices of these different uh, cultures together in this way that really just sings to my soul. And there is some evidence that at least some parts of the Greek magical papyri uh, were written by women, which also is something that fascinates me. I want to read just a small passage from the PGM as it's abbreviated. And this is my adaptation. Many named goddess who brings glory to men whose children are fared, bull-eyed one, horned one, nature, all mother, 
who brings forth gods and men, you roam around Olympus and traverse the wide and fathomless abyss. You are the beginning and the end, and you alone are mistress of all. So this is from the PGM. It's interesting if we were to expand uh, the section that I just talked about, there are different faces of the goddess evoked even in this beyond Hecate. Uh, and we see here this practice where the names of the goddess were getting at something more, getting at something truly numinous and that the one re recording uh, the text and so on they knew this and like us, they are stretching out to touch the great mother goddess and to understand her through our lens that we have available to us. Bull-eyed one and Hecate has many epithets um, associated with bulls being bullheaded and so on. And the bull was a symbol of the fertility goddess, the, the great mother goddess. Because if you look at the bull's horns, or if you have a, a picture of a bull's face, the bull's horns and its face approximate uh, an image or a symbol of the internal feminine uh, reproductive system. So the fallopian tubes and the womb. And that's why we often see um, Hecate and other great mother figures associated with bulls because of the this uh, symbolic way that fertility is represented in the head of the bull. The bull, of course, also, if you turn its horns on its side, it becomes uh, the crescent moon. And we can see here that the crescent moon becomes associated with fertility and the moon, it's, the whole moon becomes associated with fertility because perhaps through this similarity between the internal female reproductive organs and the head of a bull. So there's a lot of deep history around the symbols of the great mother goddess. And many of Hecate's epithets are indicative of her role as an all mother goddess. Even Hecate's association with the number three uh, yeah, as the triformis, trimorphous, uh, trivia, and so on, all those uh, three tripartite epithets that she has, they can also be interpreted as being indicative of a great mother goddess as well. And in this case, they are often also associated with the crossroads. So for example, um, if you have a sigil of Hecate that has a threefold representation on it, if you're watching the video version of this, you can see my sigil that represents the womb of the goddess at the bottom. And the key as a symbol of Hecate is also strongly associated with fertility. Um, when a goddess was featured with a key, it is thought to have symbolized the phallic symbol and it represents her power over the whole entire life cycle. Keys, of course, have many other different meanings. But uh, some theorists posit that when Hecate and other goddesses were featured holding keys, that that's what they meant. Uh, the dagger that Hecate was sometimes associated with in um, ancient imagery and so on was thought to be associated with midwifery. And it hearkens to her role again as the great mother goddess and her domain over mid, uh, midwifing and bringing new life into the world. And of course, the dagger also has the power to take uh, life out of the world. So it symbolizes both. And just to clarify that dagger that she carries uh, in terms of it being associated with um, birthing was that it was used to uh, cut the umbilical cord and so on as was necessary in birth. So that's another symbol of hers that is directly associated with being a great mother goddess. Her torches, her that so many of us resonate with, they are also indicative of both the womb, the great mother figure, and the phallus or the masculine principle. So the torch is actually anima, the, the feminine principle and animus combined through the fire and then you know the shaft of the torch. 
So there's another layer to understanding Hecate as a great mother goddess. Certainly she has other att attributes that may not be directly associated with fertility that also speak to her role as a great mother figure. Even her beloved hounds that so many of us love, those hounds of hers and even the ones that were guarding the gates to the underworld were often also associated they were also associated often with the life cycle, with birth and death, opening the way to the afterlife, for example, present at birth and so on. So when we start to unravel Hecate's symbols a little bit, we see just how deeply she may have been understood as a great mother goddess figure. And of course, today we can see great mother goddesses as something very different than how they would have been perceived several thousand years ago. And I wanted to just briefly get into this. The great mother goddess to the ancients was all. You know, if we think of the torch and the key as phallic symbols, it represents Hecate's dominion over all of life, that she holds the masculine principle within her hands, that she, in that sense, also represents the duality so that when we, when we peel away all the layers of the great mother, we see that she is feminine and she also contains animus or the masculine, that she is that primordial source from which all life flows and to which all life returns in the end. Today, we may kind of get caught up in that cultural trap that sees the great mother in a very different way. Particularly, we may uh, see Gaia, for example, the mother goddess or mother nature in kind of um, a way that is associated with, um, you know, environmentalism, uh, you know, the green world and so on. And certainly the great mother goddess held dominion over that, but she is so much more than, you know, mother nature who it's not nice to fool and so on. If you remember those commercials, uh, if you're a child of the eighties, like I was, and remember those shampoo commercials. So we need to, to step away from the patriarchal culture that we live in and go beyond that to explore how the ancients saw the great mother goddess and most importantly, how we see the great mother goddess within us, whether we call her Hecate, Kybele, perhaps she has no name. Perhaps she is just the woman who appears in our dreams. And I want to just explore a little bit about how this patriarchal uh, cultural lens really influences our understanding of the great mother goddess. We see this when we people get preoccupied with, well, she's a dark mother, she's a light mother, and that there's this distinction between dark mothers and light mothers, which again, to the ancients, and I would argue also to the soul, doesn't apply. That this business that, you know, Hecate is a dark mother um, is true. She is the darkness and she her darkness is so vast that she can accommodate all of ours. Yet she is also the illuminated mother um, of the Chaldean oracles, the, mid, the divine midwife. She's the illuminated mother who is the uh, sacred guardian of children and so on. So there is what we might call that illuminated aspect of Hecate in terms and also her darkness in terms of us being able to turn to her um, in the, our own dark times where her darkness is so vast that she can take on all of our darkness as well. And that we find healing by returning to the darkness of her womb or her cave. I wanna read just a short poem that I wrote uh, that is about this and it will be in, probably it's gonna find its way into my next book so just take a breath and relax a little bit and let's get into the energy of this poem. She is the darkness. She is the cry of enough. She is the sigil written in stone. She is the silent walking away of the betrayed. She is the lonely raising arms to the moon. 
She is the lie told to live the truth. She is the secret circle drawing down her moon. She is the poison that heals. She is the bold stare into the future. She is the blood shed to bring rebirth. She is all those who dare to become. She is the power that is our right. She is the dark mother and she has returned. And indeed we see the popularity of the many faces of what we might call the dark mother, although I would argue that we should just call her the great mother. Um, we see many faces of the dark mother really rising even to cultural uh, places these days, you know, such as Hecate um, in the, the television show on Netflix where she's been portrayed. And we see her in other faces of the dark mother coming back. And why is she coming back today? Why has the dark mother returned compared to the Catholic version of Mary, you know, as the Madonna, the virgin birth and so on, where, you know, she, in many of the images, you know, she has this very beatific smile, nothing stressing her out, all is well, and so on. And I, and I know that it, there are other views of Mary but we still have that kind of dominant vision of Mary as not very powerful, not uh, certainly in charge, and really just being the vessel through which uh, Jesus entered the world. And certainly in the Catholic Church, she is venerated, yet she's not venerated in the way that the pre-patriarchal goddesses were venerated over life and death and being so powerful. She's venerated for having birthed Jesus and her own attributes can be really downplayed. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to everyone who has a relationship with Mary. Um, certainly the black Madonna is a face of the great mother who has returned over uh, the past several decades to claim her place um, within our culture. And that of course grows out of hundreds and hundreds of years of the black Madonna being venerated. So we see the Dark Mother coming forward and becoming more powerful today and you know, creating that landscape where we see the Mother Goddess as so much more than the you know, very calm for having given birth only recently, Mother of Mary to a figure that is fierce, that has powers over creation and destruction uh, and so on. So is a guide, a psychopomp to the underworld can lift us up to intellectual heights and that she is very, very much of the earth. She is so much more than like an elemental uh, mother goddess figure like Gaia, although of course we can uh, expand Gaia to be much more, but uh, speaking in terms of the mythology and how who Gaia was uh, to the agents who wrote about her, she, was, she performed a very specific task uh, and was the earth embodied which is different than uh, being a great mother goddess figure. Although of course we can see her, we can see any of the goddesses as our personal uh, great mother goddess figures these days. So what happened along the way? We go from Hecate, Artemis, Kybele, Demeter, and so on being venerated as sacred as the great mother. We, and we end up in a culture today that is so influenced by patriarchy that we wanna reduce these figures and label them as dark mothers, for example, or we see a dichotomy between the Madonna and Hecate. Why is it that we see, we need to splinter these things down so much instead of understanding the great mother goddess in all of her power and glory, all of her terrifying aspects, all of her loving aspects, what, how did we get, uh, what, you know, what was the road that was walked between when she was venerated as that and to where we are today? In a really interesting book by Dr. Leonard Schlein called The Goddess Versus the Alphabet, he details this and I highly recommend it if you are interested in a truly deep dive into this. And just briefly, I'm going to touch upon, I think what are, what, um, the key ideas of that book. The, the idea is that the invention of the written word 
um, caused a shift in collective consciousness to a point that the great mother goddess with her intuition, her powers over life and death, and so on, uh, you know, the emphasis on intuition, on emotions, feeling, experiencing, the alphabet, and this is his theory, uh, caused a shift away from all of that so that the scales got really imbalanced and rational thought, intellect, uh, order, and so on became dominant and intuition and all those things became submissive. And they were traditionally associated with the feminine, uh, the mother archetype and the great goddess herself. So that there was this imbalance that happened as the alphabet, as the written word became dominant. There's a lot more to this theory. I highly recommend the goddess versus the alphabet if you're interested uh, in, in following that trail all the way back to thousands of years ago to the great mother goddess and what happened to her along the way. I also wanna recommend another book. This is an older book by um, Eric Newman. I love this book. It's called The Great Mother, an Analysis of the Archetype. It was written uh, several decades ago. So it's it, there is a little bit of a, a time warped lens that's on it. But there is he did a huge amount of research and really many of the modern books on mother goddesses and how uh, popular writings have portrayed different goddesses can all be traced back to this book. Um, so I highly recommend that if you want to really deep dive into the great mother archetype, there's many other wonderful books there, but I wanted to uh, highlight those two just to kind of get you started in that direction. If you wanted to really understand uh, the history and some of the modern theories about the great mother goddess. In my teaching and writing and in all of the years of being so privileged to interact with so many of you who write to me and so on, I've noticed that many of us come to Hecate, Hecate awakens within us and our dreams and so on, because we have a very deep, <coughs> because we have a very deep mother wound and for me, as a psychologist, this is really interesting because seeing how Hecate comes to us to help us heal that mother wound, help us heal from trauma is so powerful. I have seen you know, hundreds of my students find such deep healing um, by turning to Hecate and allowing her to become the mother they never had. And that this kind of surrogate motherhood, you know, the wise mother of Hecate replacing the wounded mother that raised us has so much healing potentiality uh, and recovery as long as we navigate our way through this relationship with Hecate in a way that is truly about healing and it's not about repeating uh, the, the mother wound that we had before. Now, let me just lift this up a little bit for us to explore. What can happen is because we have a deep mother wound, we can be looking for a substitute mother, often unconsciously. So we will attach ourselves to different goddesses, different figures, and so on as in a way of healing. While we are doing this from our trauma self, as opposed to going into it with the, the energy of healing, we can become quite possessed by the great mother goddess, by the mother archetype, because our mother complexes are so strong. And this often happens when we first uh, awaken to Hecate or Demeter or Kybele or whatever the great mother goddess uh, chooses to present herself to us as, and we be, become possessed by her so much so that this is all we think about. You know, in much in the way that a mother would get possessed by her infant child, and those of you who have children, uh, you certainly know this to be true, that you, that's all you can think about is the child. It's like the opposite of that. 
And it, we are very childlike when we come to her because even though, of course, children don't have these kind of sophisticated thoughts that we know of, um, as adults, we have very sophisticated thoughts and we can really just completely be immersed or possessed by the great mother goddess as she takes up all this space in our lives to help us heal. I hope that makes sense. Um, and if you've been involved with Hecate or another great mother goddess for a while, you can probably look back and see this in your own journey and say, yeah, I used to be fairly possessed by her. But Hecate and the other faces of the great mother are the wise mother when they're illuminated, right? When, they're, when we interact with them in their illuminated form, which of course includes what we might call darkness, um, that when we, when we allow them to take up space in our lives and our imagination and so on, that she is the wise mother and the wise mother is about creating a secure base from which to explore the world and you know my doctorate is in attachment and that's certainly the lens that I use to interpret a lot of the teachings and writings that I do in my observations from students and even the historical text that I am, you know, a scholar of attachment theory and I see us as a self in relation to other. So in relation to Hecate, she can become our secure base from which we can explore the world. Initially, we can be consumed by her and that's all we think of, she's everywhere. And over time we heal and grow stronger on our own so that she may not be so present in our lives um, at different stages, but she is soul, she's psychopomp as I talked about in the last lesson. So she's also the great mother who abides within us and helps us to learn to mother ourselves. And I'm not talking about mothering in terms of like, you know, uh, kind of the stereotypical mother figure, whether it's soccer mothers or whether it's like, you know, the uh, 1950s kind of mother. I'm talking about the, the great mother to inhabit all of the wise mother archetype that is not about coddling or fussing over us, but is about strengthening us, um, showing us the way forward without taking us by the hand because we're not small children. Although at first we may need to be led by the hand a bit because we have to go back and heal from those early adverse childhood traumas that we suffer from. So our relationship with Hecate and other faces of the great mother evolves naturally over time if we allow it to. And if we are entering into the exploration of Hecate as this great mother figure that can bring us healing. This is very different from those who would fetishize Hecate and other goddesses and kind of just reduce them um, to, you know, to objects or things that give them what they want. The great mother is, you know, beyond our comprehension. She's the primordial force and we brush against her, her numinosity at times and she abides in our soul but she's certainly not, you know, like a little object. Um, that's not, she's more. And I really just encourage you to see the great mother goddess, whether you call her Hecate as otherwise, something so much more than any object to release her from any kind of chains that might still be binding her in your own mind about how you see the great mother and let her be all. Now, I am not criticizing statues. They're fabulous. I never had one of Hecate until I started uh, writing a blog a few years ago. I thought I should get one for the photos because I've never felt the need to have a statue of the great mother. That to me, she is in everything and, in, and imbibes everything. And although I've come to love my statues, I find the great mother when I'm out in nature, I find the great mother in, you know, my children. I find the great mother in nature. I find the great mother in a horrible fire, you know, that destroys the house. I find her everywhere. 
because you know she is soul that runs through she's the essence that runs through all things and she can't be fetishized and you know as we progress in our understanding of the goddess we move beyond those childlike things of you know needing the statue or needing uh, to be handheld and led forward uh, our immaturity evaporates as we go deeper into Hecate's world. And Hecate in the world of the great mother is both the world that we see all around us, the world of form and shape and nature and the cosmos and so on. And it is also the deeper world, the world of force. And the goddess speaks to us in our dreams, in synchronicities, in our imagination, and that's how we mature in our understanding of the goddess, whether we call her Hecate or otherwise. As long as our relationship with the great mother goddess is based more upon what others tell us, what we think is right, and so on, you can see that there's a little bit of maturity there in wanting to study and get things right. But you can also see how that's kind of like the elementary school child who wants to please the mother uh, because they don't have a full understanding of the mother yet and they wanna make her happy. As we mature in our understanding of the great mother goddess, you know, we see that our lives become the offering to her that our actions become the offering to her, whether it's our environmentalism, uh, whether it's helping children, whatever it is we're doing, our lives become the offering. And although it's beautiful to make a Hecate's feast, and I write about it in Entering Hecate's Garden, you know, certainly if we want to truly venerate the many faces of the Great Mother, it's through our actions it's through holding space for others and it's through living a life of empathy where we under seek to understand others rather than to uh, you know judge them or looping back to where I began the, the podcast today, tribalizing ourselves. You know, it's interesting um, in the goddess versus the alphabet, uh, Dr. Schlein writes about how before Christianity, there weren't wars over religion in the area of the ancient Mediterranean because they understood that different cultures had different faces for the deities and that was okay. It wasn't until Yahweh came to town that the great mother goddess started to be dismantled. Uh, and we could talk about you know, the, the calf as a symbol of the goddess and, and so on in the story of Moses, um, that it wasn't until this happened that the, when the great mother goddess started to be dismantled that wars over religion started to flourish. Um, and again, that's uh, Leonard Schlein's theory that he presents in that book. There's a lot of truth to that, that there is something about an understanding of the sacred feminine as all things and about being equal with animus or the masculine principle that equates the balance and gives us that empathy we need to understand the others. And we just live in a world these days where everyone is so harsh and quick to judge others and tribalize ourselves again, you know, getting back to the start of the podcast and that whole business with like getting the goddess right. You know, will she be mad at me if this isn't really Hecate or, you know, like, well, Hecate, I don't, you know, they told me Hecate wasn't a mother goddess that she's just uh, to do with witches. When we get into all of that business, then we're repeating what, uh, you know, those first followers of Yahweh were doing, right? We're tribalizing, we're, you know, we're saying my goddess is right, your goddess is wrong, and so on. And we're getting into that in-group, out-group bias business that is not of the great mother goddess who sees all, knows all, and um, understands the different ways through life, understands the powers of destruction and creation and so on. So I encourage you to explore how the great mother goddess presents in your life. If that is Hecate for you, it may be a different face of the great mother goddess and allow her to take up presence within you, 
perhaps not completely become consumed by her because it can be very overwhelming, but take up presence and approach her with openness and curiosity rather than being worried about getting it right, seeing where she's already showing up in your life and so on, and going inward, going back to your own interior life. You know, regardless of our gender, we all have a womb within us. That is our soul. That is our interior world, our deepest secrets and desires, the things that make us truly unique. And that is what the Great Mother calls us to. And of course, you know, there is a need for balance in the world. We need to have, you know, what's called wise mind, which is the mixture of the feeling mind and the rational mind. And the, the great mother figure brings that feeling mind to the forefront. And that's where we are at a society now. We're at this tipping point. After 5,000 years of the great mother being relegated to kind of secondary roles and you know, not having cultural dominance, but certainly being venerated by many in small clusters and so on, such as the Black Madonna, um, that we see her coming back to the forefront in all of her power. And Kali Ma certainly would be another face of this that is returning to tell us that before it's too late, we need to bring the Great Mother back in all of her glory, light and darkness. And this is why I think so many of us connect on a deep level to faces of the goddess that we might call the dark mother, because we're part of this web that is the world that we live in, and our souls are connected to the collective. And we are here as emissaries, as voices of the dark mother to help correct the imbalance that's been with us for thousands of years. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the podcast. You can find out more about my books and my school at keepingherkeys.com.